scan the QR, do scan the QR and enter your name with the registration number. And then after that, we'll be commencing the quiz. Uh, the fastest uh, hands and the correct answers will walk away with uh, another gift from the courtesy of the college. And before that, let me introduce our quiz uh, presenter, like Dr. Indira Kahavita is the consultant dermatologist of anti-leprosy campaign Sri Lanka. She was the immediate past president of Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists and at present serves as the secretary of the South Asian Regional Association of Dermatology, Venerology, and Leprology. She has numerous publications on leprosy and leishmaniasis, I believe I said it correct, leishmaniasis, leishmaniasis, both nationally and internationally. Also, Dr. Kahavita has co-authored guidelines and books on leprosy published by the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. Madam, over to you. Thank you. Um, right. Is everybody ready with uh, your scanning? Can we go on? So before we begin, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Keetu Vijay Surya and Dr. Malakanti Garhena for giving me this opportunity to uh, conduct this quiz for you. So yes, let's wait. Right, okay. Um, so I'm really happy that uh, more than 80% got the answer correct. So uh, yeah, can we move on to the discussion? Yeah, the answer is tinea infection and I would like to move on to the discussion. So why are we talking about tinea infections? At the moment, tinea infections are the most difficult, challenging infection that dermatologists are facing. When I started as a dermatologist 15 years ago, it was just a matter of prescribing risofalvin and meconazole cream. Whether it is the private sector or the government sector, it was the same. Now, I have not prescribed meconazole cream since 2017. Why are we at this juncture? Because tinea infections, they are common actually, even in a clinic practice, tinea infections are the second commonest uh, skin issue in a clinic practice. And tinea infections, or if you say fungal infections, are the commonest skin issue in Sri Lanka, in a, uh, in a uh, community setting. This is both tinea and pityriasis versicolor. But the issue is, tinea infections are, these are due to filamentous fungi. We need to know that these are filamentous fungi because we need to know how to treat them. If you go back to your third year knowledge, you may remember there are certain antifungals which are working only against filamentous fungi. There are certain uh, antifungals which will not, which do not have a very good action against filamentous fungi. For instance, fluconazole, the GP's usual, the preferred antifungal, does have very little action against filamentous fungi. So you are giving fluconazole because it's easy and economical, will not help the patient. The second thing is patients are not continuing their treatment. At the moment, it's becoming a challenge because you all may have noticed non-responsiveness is an issue, right? And there is a change in the organism. We used to have trichophyton rubrum about three decades ago. Now it's changed to trichophyton mentographitis. And this new organism, which was introduced only two years ago, is not, we cannot prove this. We need genetic studies, which is not available for us in Sri Lanka. So basically, be very careful about treating fungal infections. Uh, we have a lot of reasons to believe that it's not only the change in organism, but one, the poor compliance by patients, but mostly it's the misuse of steroids and combination steroids. Some general practitioners tend to think that Okay, if it is a combination, it will work against any possibility. So if I don't have a diagnosis, I will use a triple combination. One of my friends told me, Gal Ahura Gehuot, Kohata Harivadi. 
හැබැයි ගල් අහුර ගැහුවම අඹ ගහටත් වදී යහපත් තියෙන ජනෙල විදුරුත් කැඩෙන්න. So දැන් ඕගොල්ලෝ කරන්නේ ජනෙල විදුරු කඩනවා. So please let's not do this. Actually regarding triple combinations the college is trying our best to stop triple combinations. No new triple combinations are being registered and even the ones that are there they will not be re-registered. And now the next step is with the help of actually it's the initiative of the college of microbiologists combinations of antifungals or antibiotics with potent topical steroids will not be allowed. So it's only combinations of hydrocortisone and antifungal or hydrocortisone and antibiotic which will be allowed in the future. New registrations, new re-registrations are not being given. Right? And when it is not happening, please don't think that you can mix betamethasone and uh, meconazole and give the patient. Please don't do that. Okay, this is how tinea infections will present. These are the usual unaltered presentations anybody would be able to diagnose. But what's more challenging is this. The changed clinical picture due to steroid use. Look at that lady's face. Would any of you think of tinea there? You will not, right? For our purposes, when somebody has a scaly rash in the face, we look for tinea infections elsewhere. My first question to that person would be, right? So please remember, if there's any rash that looks a bit odd, ask that question, because the vast majority, they start in the groins. More than two-thirds of the patients with tinea infections, they will have at least one lesion in the flexures. Next slide, please. Yeah. So I'll just give you some practical tips on the management of tinea infections for every, all intents and purposes. Please don't add steroids. The patient may be complaining of itching and begging you to give it. Just give antihistamines, try to control the itching. Explain to them you cannot do this. And what I tell the patients now is, I'm now giving you the last drug that is effective. If this is not working, you will have to go home and continue scratching, right? You have to do that. And if you're using topical agents, it's best to use two topical agents, two different ones. Uh, but the vast majority now need oral antifungals. Now, uh, if it is the trichophyton endotinia, terbinafine is useless in 70%. Oral terbinafine is not useful in 70%. We give itraconazole for a longer duration, not two weeks. It's either four weeks or six weeks. The current recommendation is double dose for three months. Just imagine how anybody is going to afford this, right? So I told you why fluconazole is not indicated and uh, because nobody has been using grisofalvin much, grisofalvin may have some, uh, it may be useful. And treatment of all affected individuals is important and cleaning of fomites. So the clothes, or uh, mostly clothes, may, uh, may help in transmitting the disease. So all these facts are important. It's not just prescribing, but also giving them all this advice, right? So tinea infections, if there is any one condition that a GP needs to know in and out completely and comply by some guidelines, it's tinea infection, right? So we move on to the next uh, question. Right. A 47 year old male, history of applying diclofenac gel on the painful thigh, and then comes with these lesions. What's the most likely diagnosis here? Aha. Can somebody tell me what the actual answer is? Katie, what's the, the answer here? <laughs> it is not allergic contact dermatitis, guys. It is herpes zoster. I don't know whether the picture is not very clear. Uh, I, from what I can see from here, the picture I see on that screen and what I see on this screen are not exactly the same. But the story, the patient had a pain in the thigh, Yes, 
you apply diclofenac gel or whatever, Siddhalepa, anything. And then when the, the bullous eruption erupts, you think it is an allergy. But the, the clue is given there, the pain, right? That is how patients will present. They will present with, present to the surgical ward with pain, uh, symptoms of sciatica and then erupt with the blisters. Or they may end up in, they may come to medical wards with the chest pain, right? One patient was admitted to a medical ward with chest pain and like bef they did a troponin and then before discharging they sent the patient to me to treat a possible fungal infection underneath the breast to see that it was a herpes zoster. When I told her that the chest pain was due to the, that the, the chest pain preceded the blistering and this was herpes zoster, the patient's response was, aparadha magi rupiyal tundaha, troponin karanne gear. Hare? So that's the story. So again, now you see, we forget that story. There is a prodromal pain. And then you get this, right? Uh, so I, I specifically use this, uh, not to catch you, but for, to make you see that this is highly possible, right? You, you yourselves understood. Can we, next slide? Yeah, so herpes foster may present like, that is a very obvious picture, but on this side, you get only this erythema, right? So it may be atypical. And remember, the possibility, and now I told you about the ulnatural chest pain, sciatica, and if there's a very nice midline demarcation. Now, of course, I was not fair when I gave you just one leg, right? Uh, so how do we treat? The treatment is acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times daily for seven days, not five days, please remember. And also most of these people will have pain, so they need to be given what? Amitriptyline, gabapentin, or pregabalin, right? One of those three. Because especially why even a three, four days old uh, zoster we treat because Acyclover can help with the pain as well, right? Uh, okay, more. next slide. Yeah, next question. Yes. Again, uh, I'm not sure about the quality of the picture, right? Anyway, a 32-year-old male presented with asymptomatic lesions over the left wrist for eight months. What's the most likely diagnosis? Right, okay, good. Um, yeah. So this is cutaneous leishmaniasis. If you get asymptomatic lesions, which are persistent on an exposed area of the body, now remember leishmaniasis, the, the prevalence of leishmaniasis is about twice that of leprosy in Sri Lanka now. So we see at least 4,500 cases reported. There may be non-reported cases, right? And now leishmaniasis is not a disease of only uh, Anuradhapura, Polonnaru or the South. Shall we move on to the next? Yeah. So this is how leishmaniasis presents initially. This sort of acneform papules which progress to uh, lesions like here you get a crusted, indurated. Induration is the key here. When you palpate the lesion, you feel it's quite firm to hard. So that is called induration. And I have marked out the area of induration here, right? So induration and then the central crusting. When the crust falls off, you end up with uh, volcano-like lesions like you get there. Next slide, yeah. Or you can get plaques like here or non-healing ulcers like what you get in the right side. The face is an area of predilection Again, remember, this is an, uh, the vector is a sand fly. So it will find areas where it can perch. So the tip of the nose, the upper part of the, the helix. Whereas leprosy is here, leishmaniasis is here, right? So it could be as bad as this. Now, all these are my patients whom I had treated in Polonnaruwa, right? So you see, all these need systemic treatment. 
So how do you suspect leishmaniasis? Asymptomatic, long-standing lesions. Uh, yes, southern, north central, northwestern, central. But remember, Kurunagala, there is a new pocket. Ratnapura, there is a new pocket. Meerigama, Vatupitiwala, Veyangoda, that area, there is a new pocket. Right? And when I was in Homagama, Padukka, I saw the beginnings of a new pocket. So don't forget leishmaniasis in your DDs. Right? Okay. Next slide. Yeah. I think it's the next question. Right. Okay. 38 year old male with multiple lesions over the trunk and limbs for 12 years. No other abnormality in the system examination. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, anybody can tell me what the diagnosis is? Um, yeah, I was expecting you to talk about leprosy and MF, so that the answer is mycosis fungoides or cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, I use this slide to tell you that there is such an entity which is not so rare, and also to remind you that leprosy is another differential diagnosis. So rightfully, 20% of you had thought of leprosy. But what my clue there was no other, no abnormality in system examination. By the time someone who has had hypopigmented patches of leprosy for 12 years, they are very likely to have at least a peripheral neuropathy. So this patient did not have anything. So even though we call it a, um, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah. So the DDs here would be Petrasis versicolor, leprosy, hypopigmented MF, early vitiligo, and post-inflammatory changes due to anything. So let's just, you know, go through all these. So leprosy could present like this, or there on the right side, you see the patches, uh, but those patches had a little reddish tinge. And please don't forget Petrasis versicolor. The feature here is the lesions are, yes, multiple, well defined, but they are, they have a very mild scale, a very fine scale. And the other thing they would tell you is, oh, it's itchy when the skin is wet. Right? And Petrasis versicolor being one of the commonest skin problems in Sri Lanka. It can coexist with leprosy, like we see there. You get the large leprosy patch, which has been biopsied, and you get the multiple lesions. All these other lesions around that patch are versicolor. Right. Early vitiligo can look like that, but hypopigmented MF, you see that is a young girl, right? So it could be like what you see here are the di digitate, finger-like lesions, hypopigmented patches. Uh, this, even though it is called uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, the hypopigmented variety is the commonest and it does not act like a malignancy. So we don't consider this as a malignancy. The treatment for hypopigmented MF is several sessions of UVB therapy, only that. But we do screen them. Next slide. Yeah. The question? Which of these lesions seen in infants needs early referral? Come on. So you all are not going to refer the, the pigment, the melanocytic nevus as your early referral? So you get here a melanos congenital melanocytic nevus. That is Wardenberg syndrome, just the white forelock. It doesn't need referral. This is blush lines. These don't need an early referral. That is, an that is a hemangioma in a non-vital area. So even that does not need an early referral. This is what needs an early referral. This is the bathing trunk nevus. Right? So let's move on to the next question. Right. 42-year-old female referred to the skin clinic for management of white patches in the hands. What's the most likely diagnosis? Again, I don't know whether you can see the white patches. They are here. Right, okay, good. The majority know the answer. 
yeah, that uh, it is systemic sclerosis. So I'll just take you through the uh, clinical features, just the pictures, right? So in systemic sclerosis, you will see this uh, digital gangrene, I, both in hands and feet, like you see here. And you may get proximal sclerosis, the sausage-shaped fingers that you saw th on the other uh, picture. Next slide. The white patches, these are called speckled leucoderma, very tiny lesions which usually occur along the hairline, in the neck, or like in the head and neck area, and in the hands and feet. So these are a little bit different from vitiligo, whereas this is more very tiny speckled kind of depigmentation. Yeah, I think that's the last slide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for that uh, fruitful session on dermatologic issues. And uh, we have a winner that is none other than uh, Dr. Finas, Dr. Fatima Finas, 30, who is the fastest hands and also like the answers like tight, but then fastest hands walks away. So, madam, I kind of request madam to give away this uh, gift to Dr. Finas. Thank you very much, Dr. Indra Kahavita. And madam, you also have a token of appreciation. Kindly request you to wait on stage. And I can request uh, the secretary of the college, Dr. Priyanta Halambarachige, to uh, give away the token of appreciation to our consultant dermatologist, Dr. Ms. Indra Kahavita. Thank you very much. And we are moving on with the sessions. That is, next is the bladder outflow obstruction conducted by Professor Srina Chandrasekhar, consultant genitourinary surgeon. And to chair the uh, occasion, I coordinate invite our president of the college, Dr. Mrs. Malkanti Galhena, and the secretary of the college, Dr. Priyanta Halambarachige. I invite Professor Srina Chandrasekhar uh, to deliver his lecture today on bladder outlet, outlet obstruction. It's with great honor and privilege that we introduce Professor Srinath K. Chandrasekhar, consultant, geniturinary surgeon, lecturer at the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Javadhanapura, Sri Lanka. He obtained his post training at the PGIM and the King's College Hospital in London. Professor Chandrasekhar stands as a trainer in undergraduate and postgraduate urological surgery. He has served as a present president of the College of Surgeons and the Sri Lanka Association of Urological Surgeons. And he also held the position as chairperson of the Specialist Training Board of Urological Surgery. Today, Professor Srinath K. Chandrasekhar shall grace us with his insights on an important in urology, bladder outflow tract obstruction. It's over to you, Professor Srinath. Uh, thank you, Dr. Galhena, uh, the president, for the very kind introduction. And it's lovely to uh, share the stage with my good friend, uh, Priyanta Halambarachi. Uh, he was my batchmate, and we've shared lots of 